I have so many wonderful things that I associate uh, with this church, uh, but doubtless one of my favorites is the annual strawberry supper. Unfortunately, for the first time in decades, no one in my family was able to attend the supper. Uh, we had other pressing concerns, but, but we were certainly thinking about it. Now, I don't know if you still pick your own strawberries, but when I was growing up, that's exactly what we did. We uh, came here, we picked the strawberries for the dinner, we stemmed them, we washed them, we, we kept the choicest ones to the top of the, the shortcake. Well, such memories brought to mind for me a story that you might be familiar with about strawberries. There, there was this guy from the city who decided he would grow a, a garden in his small backyard. In fact, he decided to grow strawberries. One Saturday morning, he drove his luxury sedan out of the city, winding his way along many unfamiliar rural roads out into the country, going back and forth until he, he finally came upon a farm, and he saw a farmer standing near a barn, so he pulled up, and uh, he said to the farmer, uh, hey, can I have some manure? And the farmer said, uh, sure, we've got plenty. Help yourself. He said, but, but what are you going to do with it? And, man from the city said, well, I'm going to put it on my strawberries. And the farmer said, well, each his own, but around here we like sugar. <laughs> <laughs> so the guy from the city shook his head, loaded the pails of manure into the trunk of his car, and then asked the farmer, hey, can you tell me how to get back to the city? The farmer said, no. He said, well, can you at least tell me how to get back to the highway to get to the city? The farmer again said, no. Well, frustrated, the city slicker blurted out, you're not very smart, are you? And the farmer said, well, maybe not, but at least I ain't lost. <laughs> Would you please bow your head? And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh, our Lord, our strength, and our salvation. Amen. Well, those are some pretty old jokes, just like the old riddles. But they do point to a couple of important truths, I think. First, it's easy to be misunderstood. And second, it's important to know where you're going. For example, have you ever been invited to travel with a friend, perhaps uh, on a vacation or some other destination? It can be very exciting, but it can also be very challenging. I mean, you have to have some idea where they're going, and especially if you're going to follow behind them. I mean, it isn't always easy to follow behind somebody else. Um, then you might ask questions like, what should I pack? And what will the weather be like? How do we get there? How long is it going to take? And then your friend says, well, just trust me, it'll be okay. Now, typically, if your friend, if it's really a good friend who's going to invite you to join them on vacation, they're going to say something like this. Oh, you'll love it. It's so relaxing there. They have the best food got to see those sunsets. It's the most beautiful place you've ever seen. It's heaven. And, and better yet, once we get there, we're going to stay next to week. Well, obviously your friends want you to go, so they're painting a beautiful picture of what it will be like. They're encouraging you to join them. They might be embellishing just a little, but they want you to decide to follow them on the journey. Well, in contrast, Consider the recruitment notice that Ernest Shackleton posted to have people join him on his great expedition across the Antarctic. Shackleton's accomplishments as a leader started with the selection of the primary crew for the endurance. He handpicked some members, including two who had served with him faithfully and done exceptionally well on a previous expedition. But to recruit the rest, he posted the following notice in the paper. Men wanted for a hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return is doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Shackleton's recruitment notice was brutally honest about the discomforts and dangers to be faced when the endurance crew members actually faced each and every one of those challenges mentioned above, they accepted them as best they could because they'd been forewarned about the conditions. Then they looked to Shackleton, whom they called the boss, 
for guidance, both for their physical well-being as well as their emotional well-being. Well, in today's gospel lesson that we just read responsibly, Jesus is going on a journey, an expedition of sorts. He has started with some of his hand-picked crew members, right? We call them the disciples. But now he's inviting others to come along. He, he actually has invited you and me to join him. He's making his final journey toward Jerusalem. It's in preparation for him to be taken up to heaven. Not unlike the Old Testament lesson where we heard of Elijah being taken up into heaven. But, but Jesus still has much work to do along the way. But oddly enough, his invitation can sound a little like an invitation from Shackleton to join the endurance group. In fact, as I read various accounts of the scripture in preparation for today's message, uh, different biblical translations had uh, headings to the section that read like this, all following a common theme. From the Good News Bible, it's entitled, The Would-Be Followers. The New International Version puts it this way, the cost of following Jesus. And yet another, I think it was the Living Bible, put it this way. The title of the section was The Hardship of the Apostolic Calling. Now, before we unpack the scripture related to that, I think it's important for us to take a look at the verses that come before it. That they describe the leader. Now, just as with the endurance, it was the character and the reputation of the leader that made others want to follow on this difficult journey. If you want, you can grab your Bibles. I'm going to be uh, uh, reading again from um, the book of Luke, and uh, starting in chapter 9. It'll be verse 51. And it says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. As the time approached, Jesus resolutely set out. My friends, when, when you're planning to journey to a specific place, you have to know the best time to go. Jesus knew it was time. The time was approaching for him to be taken up to heaven. And, and just as importantly, I want you to take a look at the description of Jesus' attitude, a, a description of his character. He didn't just leave willy-nilly. No, he resolutely set out on the journey set before him by God. And I just love that word. I mean, if you're going to follow someone, especially to places unknown or dangerous, you don't want an equivocating, wishy-washy sort of leader. You want to follow someone who is resolute. Other versions of the of Bible from that passage translate it this way, steadfast. Jesus was steadfast. Jesus made up his mind. He set his face firmly toward Jerusalem. But perhaps the one that captures the best, at least for me, is from the Living Bible, and it says, As the time drew near for his return to heaven, he moved steadily onward toward Jerusalem with an iron will. Friends, when the time draws near, you want to follow the person who moves steadily onward with an iron will, don't you? We might come back to that a little bit later, but I want to spend a few minutes looking at and considering Jesus' invitation to us today along the way. Well, first, there's the man that willingly says, hey, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, just, doesn't that sound like the kind of guy that you want to have joining you on a journey? Be part of your party. I mean, seriously, seriously this person is really into it. But Jesus doesn't say, hey, that's great, come on along, glad to have you. No, instead of a warm reception, Jesus replies with a warning of sorts. In verse 58, Jesus responds with this. Foxes have dens, birds have nests, but I, the Son of God, have no place to lay my head. Haven't we all been there in our walk with the Lord? Uh, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever, wherever you want to go, just bring it on. And then when the going gets tough, we aren't so resolute anymore, are we? Now, I don't think Jesus was looking to dissuade the would-be follower, just like he isn't looking to dissuade us, but instead he was being honest. He was offering a reality check. Following him was not going to include overnights at the Hilton with a continental breakfast in the morning. It was never about earthly comfort or possessions. 
It was all about where Jesus was heading to and where he was inviting us to go. Now next in verse 59, he actually picked somebody himself uh, to join him. And he, and he said it the way he had many times before. He just simply says, follow me. But instead of just dropping his nets and uh, following as some of the first disciples did, this person said, and understandably so, Lord, first let me go bury my father. Now, we know that Jesus is pro-family, right? He's pro-father, but he doesn't say, oh, sure thing, you do that, and then catch up with us later. No, instead he says, let the dead bury the dead. You, instead, proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, at first reading, this is a rather harsh statement, and again, not the sort of thing you would say to somebody if you really wanted them to join you on your trip. It was rather off-putting. Now, I won't spend a lot of time on this verse today, but, but what Jesus is saying, at least in part, is that I have more important things to do. I have more important things for you to do. I have an eternal place that I'm heading to, and I want you to go with me. I want you to go with me without the earthly distractions of social responsibilities that are imposed by people that have no idea what eternity is. You see, in Jesus' time, it was the obligation of the oldest son to take care of his father until his death. So what the man was really saying was this, let me stay at home and take care of my father when he eventually dies and eventually I bury him, then I'll come along with you. Then I'll follow Jesus wasn't saying he shouldn't care for his father, but what he was saying is, you have to act now. You need to follow me now. You have to preach the kingdom now. It is a warning not to put off until tomorrow the call that you're hearing today. You know, certainly I don't think that Jesus was suggesting that during my father's recent illness and death that my family and I shouldn't have taken care of him or, or buried him. Rather, what we were called to do is to not forget to put Christ first. And I believe that's what we did. We stayed together and we prayed together. So too, this church family did the same thing. They honored my father by putting God first. We celebrated his life by worshiping the Lord. Now, now finally, Jesus meets up with a third person who, who seemingly, seemingly wants to join the expedition. And what does he say? We just read it. Yes, Lord, I will come and follow you. <clears throat> then there's the button. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family and the people at home. Now, Jesus doesn't say, well, of course, and please send my regards as well. No, he responds instead with, no one who puts their hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for the service of the kingdom of God. Could Jesus possibly mean you shouldn't say goodbye to your family? I mean, what happened to honor your mother and father? No, I don't think that was what it was about. You see, what Jesus understood in the way that only Jesus could understand sometimes, he looked in the guy's eyes, he looked into his heart, as he does to you and to me, and, and he realized that what the guy was really saying was, Sir, let me go ask my family's permission first. Let me see what they're going to say about this. I mean, we can understand that, right? I mean, hey, mom and dad, I'm going to go off to join the circus. Oh, no, you're not. You're staying right here. We can relate, can't we? How many times we put our hand to the plow, plowing the kingdom fields right here in, in Naugatuck, in our workplaces, soup kitchens, food banks, sometimes mission fields abroad, homeless shelters. And when we go back to say goodbye to our people, in other words, tell them what we're doing, sometimes we get this, what are you doing then? Let them take care of themselves. It's dangerous. Let someone else do it. What's wrong with what you were doing before? It just doesn't make sense. My friends, I know where Jesus is calling us to go, though I don't know along which particular path he will ask you to travel. No doubt, however, his warnings are true. Along the way, there will be hardships, there will be distractions, and there will be detour. And that is why he so directed his response to those who would follow him. Now, in addition to my clinical responsibilities at work, I am, I am the manager of our safety health program, and in June is National
national safety awareness month. Um, one of the weeks, the focus was on safe driving. And so I'm wondering, have you ever heard of the two second rule? Some people call it the three second rule. But what it recommends is that you stay two seconds behind the car in front of you in order to avoid an accident. And then, then there's also a, a five second rule. The five second rule says this, that if you're traveling 55 miles an hour, if you take your eyes off the road, just five seconds, let's say, to text, let's say to check the look in the mirror, let's say to be distracted by the person who's exhibiting road rage. Take your eyes off the road for just five seconds at 55 miles an hour, you're going to travel the length of a football field. Imagine how far off the course and how much damage you can do in such a short period of time. And I think that is in part what Jesus is talking about. And he's asking us not to be distracted even for a second. We don't want to be distracted drivers on this journey that he's invited us on. He wants us to be resolute and focused with an iron will. You see, you can end up going off course and even getting lost, even crashing and burning, if you don't follow that two and five second rule. You see, like the persons Jesus encounters in Luke's Gospels, we can be distracted by desires for earthly comfort and pleasures. We can be distracted by the busyness of social obligations and, and conformity. We can be distracted by looking back for approval and acceptance after we've started to plow our field. The words of the powerful hymn that we'll sing a little bit later put it this way. Oh, let me feel thee near me. The world is ever near. I see the lights that dazzle me, the tempting sounds I hear. My foes are ever near me, around me and within. But Jesus, Jesus, draw me nearer and shield my soul from sin. In Galatians 5, uh, verse 7, and it was uh, the other lectionary reading, we didn't read it, but I read it in preparation for today. Uh, the Apostle Paul puts it this way, and it's just a great line. He says, you were running a good race. Who cut in? You were running a good race. Who cut in on you? Can't you just visualize it? And then he goes on to say, they cut in on you, and they kept you from obeying the truth. And that's what happens, isn't it? Sometimes we find ourselves off course or, or lost, and then we need to ask, what distracted us? How did we get so far off course? Who cut in on us? I mean, we were running a good race. We were driving a good course. I know that in my own life, there have been times that I have been in the fast lane for the Lord. But then, I found myself off course. Sometimes it was because I drove past the pace bar. That would be Jesus. If my eyes weren't fixed on the correct finish line, I would get so far off course. You know, you've heard it said that if it if you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there. Still, other times I was thrown off course by the noise and distractions of others. People in a different lane, maybe I should be over that way, or, or, or accolades. People say, hey, great job. But there were accolades about me, not about the work that God was doing through me as his instrument. And then, and then there's finally, there's times that we get off course during this journey, because we forget to take a pit stop every once in a while. Statistics show an alarming number of drivers who fall asleep at the wheel and others that are just sort of in this somnolent uh, state and keep driving. And, and for folks, I believe that the same thing can happen in our ministries. If we don't take the time to rest and refuel, we rest and refuel by praying alone, worshiping together, taking time in the world. That's how we refuel. Now, along the way, in addition to distractions, we will encounter decoys. Now, that whole idea is a message for another time, but if you're experiencing a detour in your walk with the Lord right now, in your own faith journey, that's okay. It's to be expected. If we go back uh, to Luke, we see that Jesus encountered a detour as soon as he set out. He had sent his disciples ahead to a village to prepare the way, and they rejected him they knew he was going to Jerusalem. And so his well-meaning disciples, James and John, said, Lord, do you want us to fall down fire from the heaven and destroy them? But Jesus rebuked them. 
they weren't getting it. They didn't understand what it was all about. He had someplace else to go, so he just went to another village. He went another way. Folks, there are times that you will encounter opposition and you'll encounter people. But Jesus will help you to find another way to get where you're going. Every time. Friends, I guess the question is, have you made the personal decision to follow Jesus on the journey he's inviting you to? There will be distractions, there will be detours, but there should be no turning back. The Son of God has invited you to come with him. He's provided some warnings, but also, like a very best friend who wants you to join him on a special journey, he says this, I just know who you are. It's the most beautiful place you've ever seen. It's heaven. And better yet, once we get there, we're going to stay forever. 